It's an honor for me to be here. Um, really excited to be here and, and to give this, uh, give this perspective for, uh, for you. And thank you, Andra, for uh, suggesting it and the organizing committee uh, for making it happen. Um, so I'm going to talk about cultivating data excellence. I'm talking mostly about agriculture because I work for the US Department of Agriculture um, at the National Agricultural Library. Uh, so, of course, when we uh, are, are thinking about this, and, and there's been a lot of, you know, I think some parts of our talks today, I'll repeat, we're all trying to come on the same digital page, we're trying to bring things together, we're trying to standardize uh, so that we can make our data interoperable, and the USDA is no different. Uh, we do have some mandates, regulations, laws in certain areas. It doesn't cover everything, but there's certain big chunks. Geospatial Data Act, for example, just came into play. Uh, in October, we knew it was coming, we've tried to prepare. Um, so there's a lot of uh, incentives other than this is a really good idea uh, that we have across the government um, to work with. And of course, we want to make our data fair. Many people have talked about fair, but we also worry about making our data care. And the way I look at these two is, that, and they overlap for sure, uh, but the fair data principles I think you are very uh, familiar with. This is, to me, is more about the machine part of it, usually uh, more emphasis there, whereas the care part of it is the human in the loop, the validation, making sure that people uh, are benefiting from it. And, and this is really, uh, especially thinking about our indigenous or, or uh, populations that have been underserved or underrepresented, to make sure that their data, that they can control it, um, that, that it's theirs and that it's, it's, they're being responsible, the, the presentation of it is ethical, and so this is getting at things like bias, but other, other issues that relate to that too. So we want our data to be both fair and care. Um, and then what would a government talk be without a little bit of alphabet soup? So I'm going to kind of go through this. I mean, you can take notes now. Hopefully you'll, I don't know if you'll remember all these, but when I put this together, I said, boy, there's like, what is there, eight or ten of these things on here. Sorry about that. But uh, they'll slip out of my mouth, so um, here we go. USDA is the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, we have about 100,000 employees all over the um, US and around the world. Um, uh, the REE is the Research, and Educa Research, Education, and Economics Mission Area. That's where the National Ag, Ag Library sits. We are part of the Agricultural Research Service, which is the ARS. Um, and, uh, the, and NAL is the National Agricultural Library. It's one of, I think, three or four or five um, national, ag li uh, national libraries that we have. Um, NALT, you'll hear, is the National Ag Library Thesaurus concept space. I'll talk about that now. Um, we, we don't add the CS because the world knows this is NALT. We're in Wikidata is NALT, so we're going to keep NALT. Um, but we'll talk about the changes there. N4MA is the NALT for the Machine Age initiative, which I started uh, since I came to the library about six years ago. Um, and that's, that's the driving force behind what I'm going to talk about, the changes that we're making. PDI is another uh, Ag Research Service initiative, uh, the Partnerships for Data Innovations, uh, who are, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about them, but that's our main partner that uh, we're working with for the, sur for the USDA Semantics Survey. NACA, N-A-C-S, is uh, an, a non-assistance cooperative agreement uh, that we have with Hueso University in Spain, uh, Hueso Lab at Oviedo University in Spain, and technically it's with the Oviedo uh, University Foundation. We'll talk about that. And then ESRI, E-S-R-I, is a company called Environmental Systems Research Institute. They're one of the world leaders in geospatial uh, data handling. They have a big part to play all across the federal government, uh, not just with USDA, but of course, Agriculture is very concerned with where things are because that changes the climate, the soil, the plants, and all the things that, that uh, could be important to a lot of agriculture. So you'll hear those things. These are the key players that hopefully we're bringing together for collective benefit for all of us. Uh, USDA data management, um, you know, we don't have to go into a lot of detail here. The problems and, and, and challenges that we have at USDA with data management mirror a lot of the things that we've heard all day. Um, you know, we have a lot of data, uh, collecting the data, processing the data, having standard uh, collection processes and, and ways to, to tag the data, the metadata that we use. Uh, there's a lot of legacy data at ARS. We've been around since the 1800s. Um, so, you know, that's, that's an issue, but the data is, is quite valuable. 
Uh, and of course, then as we bring data out, one of the recent uh, developments at USDA that I've observed for looking at analysis of this data is the prefer you know, just, just proliferation of uh, Power BI dashboards and things like that. Just hundreds of them being made, contests within the agency. And, and some of them really don't ever get looked at because nobody's really sure what they're trying to say, but they really look cool. Um, so you have those kinds of issues there. Opportunities on, on the right side here. Um, USDA leadership could require, and in some cases does require, uh, uniformity across the department and management efforts, which is a, which is a unique uh, opportunity for semantic uh, goals, uh, if you will. It doesn't mean it's really easy to do uh, or that it's happening. And, and so we have sort of a, a fits and starts kind of thing, I would say, but it's something that I'm working with at my level to try to provide something. And the USDA survey is one idea to try to provide some uniformity and some ease of entry for some of our more hesitant uh, staff. Uh, large amounts of diverse data available. We over here said it was a, was a problem. Well, it's also an opportunity. You've probably all had instances where you wish you had a little more data than you do. Uh, we have a lot of data if we can get at it. Um, and of course, it's, it, that provides a really uh, interesting opportunity to integrate that and to develop uh, data management practices. The return on investment for the department is potentially huge. Uh, if we can actually really be successful at doing this. And then, of course, for the, for the public uh, to be able to access information freely and to be able to integrate information from different parts of the department. I'm going to talk a little bit and show you a little bit about how big it is and how much uh, diversity it covers. Uh, and it also, if we can do this, it uh, responds to a lot of these regulations that we need to be responding to that maybe we're kind of responding to. You know, we haven't really quite hit it yet either, um, but we're working very hard to do that. And then, of course, uh, I came into the library and one of my responsibilities was the NALT, was the thesaurus, and that is an amazing resource. It's been uh, first published in 1967, so nearly 60 years of building this agricultural resource of things that are important, and there's a lot of history behind that. And then the, the project itself, not for the machine age, uh, hopefully the name speaks for itself, what I was trying to do with the thesaurus, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those details. Um, we are focused on semantic data collection now, and that's what the survey's about, um, and, and focused on the user and how, how that feels to go through that semanticization of their data. So uh, that brings that focus, and I'm, I'm kind of circling it over here. You can see we're, this is where we are. And this, this graphic was made by the Partnerships for Data Innovation, our partner. And you can see the little puzzle piece there, PDI. We're working with them. And we're working with data collection. So that brings more challenges, right? So I, now the, the right side's chained to a challenge. Uh, USDA has established an absolute need for our people to do this. We have, you know, I work in the Ag Research Service, so we have data researchers, scientists with their own labs. They all have their own way of doing things. Uh, some of them work together great, others not so much. Um, but they, either by choice, by rule, or regulation, they're gonna need to uh, semanticize their data and make it interoperable. Um, so we've learned, though, as many have said explicitly and were intimidated today, uh, there's a general resistance for staff to meet this need due to this difficulty of, of working with the semantic part of it. Uh, and the traditional method for semantic data collection and modeling, what we've learned in the last couple of years is just not going to meet the timeline constraint that I am under to have this done, uh, that, that we are under to have this done. The Geospatial Data Act, we were getting ready, we we're getting ready, and October came and went, and a lot of it is done, but there's still some pockets out there that really need to work on this. Um, we've looked at vendors, the USDA in various parts of the agency, it's very, very big, as I said, 100,000 people, um, has looked for more quick fixes for like text mining solutions or companies that do this sort of thing. And overall, you know, they, they haven't performed as well as we need them to, and they do work in silos, even those work in silos. Some other agency does with this company, and then another agency does with the other company, and they're not really talking. So as I said, our researchers uh, have clearly expressed some hesitation in uh, doing this kind of work. And this is, this is not an uncommon reaction that we get from some groups. 
uh, where we start to work with them, we can get to a certain point, and then it's like, if you tell me about a property versus an entity one more time, I think I'm going to do this. So um, this is something that we need to take into consideration. That's not to say that all of them are like that. It just kind of depends on, the, you know, genomics folks are much more familiar. Uh, people that work with taxonomic organisms, much more comfortable. People that are doing maybe water quality analysis out in the woods, not so much. So the next few slides, these are too busy. These are too much. But I'm not really thinking so much that you read them, but that you get a sense of USDA, the kinds of that the department is working on, the diversity of the data types, the types of research, and very importantly, the cultures of these domain groups is vastly different, quite a wide range. So we have work on types of farming, which could you know, take into many different crops, but it's talking about you know, rotational, no-till, you know, rural, urban, whatever, agricultural practices, just looking at some of the conservation kind of things. And they may not always talk to the other guy. There's overlap, but they probably don't even go to the same meetings. Natural resources, again, you see some overlap on this particular slide, um, but, you know, you can kind of run down those. I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, and again, here, just some more. Sorry, this photograph is overwriting uh, some of the words. Agricultural economics, totally business, international trade, policy, that kind of thing. The, the concepts that we have there are very different. Agriculture extension and education is a big part of USDA's mission. This starts with young children all the way up to land-grant universities, which is our system of agricultural colleges, extension offices in, in every county, uh, maybe a little less due to budget in a few years, but but these are programs that teach college students how to become animal scientists, so it's, it's covering a lot of ground. But it's also talking to producers about how to better grow their crops, how to employ uh, sustainable systems. Um, it's talking to consumers about consumer safety. It's talking about human nutrition and dietary education in this, kind of, in this uh, section. And then, of course, ag technology. There's an app for everything, precision agriculture, using global position systems. Uh, you know, I, for, for I, my background is in bioinformatics and computational biology, and for my doctorate, I made an app that takes a picture of a goat and sends back measurements and the weight, and it can give some health measurements. You know, these are the kind of things that are being uh, built uh, in agriculture. And then I think this is the last one. Again, rural, devel rural development and society, this is very cultural. This is very... Uh, not, not the hard biosciences that you think of. This is economics, this is jobs, uh, this is rural access to internet and electricity, rural access to health care. Uh, so you see telemedicine there, food security in terms of access and quality and understanding what's good to eat uh, to keep yourself healthy. All those things are there. We have a lot of human nutrition, and just in the ARS, we have several human nutrition research centers around the country that are looking at, you know, if you eat more blueberries, will it help prevent cancer? You know, they're doing all this kind of research plus running those uh, tests. If, if you're familiar in the U.S., all the foods that you buy will have a food label on them so that the consumer knows what's in the food. Uh, right down from the street from the library is the lab that worked on the food composition, and that's what is making up those labels. Not directly, but indirectly, the food composition. This, you may have heard on this group, uh, food on, which is uh, the, the, the newest um, machine age transformation of our nutrition database, which was the most visited uh, resource in the government, not the agriculture department, in the entire government. Uh, teachers would uh, make, you know, nutrition, uh, you know, things for their classroom to go look up certain things. And also researchers, people selling foods and needing to make these labels would resource that kind of information. And then, of course, the Forest Service. We kind of get into a whole totally different thing. Here we have, of course, firefighting, all kinds of equipment and different things and research on equipment. How can we mitigate fire? How can we fight fire? How can we keep firefighters from being you know, killed while fighting fires? How can we evacuate people safely? Um, and then, of course, we have the forests and the national parks. The, forest, uh, the national forest, they have recreation. They have need law enforcement, you know, in these areas. 
Um, so there's just just the incredible breadth of of work that is handled by the Department of Agriculture. So you see, it's a lot of different types of data. It's a lot of different types of people. Uh, it's a lot of different types of engagement and willingness to do what is needed to do to meet the requirements that the government wants us to do for interoperability. Uh, and then just sort of this slide, I'm hoping we'll sort of sum all that up. This is just the official, this is all our departments, our, not our, depart our agencies and our offices. The four that I have highlighted are from the research, education, and extension mission area. That's where I sit uh, in, as part of the Ag Research Service. So that's Ag Research Service, Economic Research Service, National Ag Statistics Service, which does the census of agriculture every 10 years, and the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, which funds grants for universities and companies, the Small Business Innovation Research Program. So that's just to give you a sense of what I'm dealing with. <laughs> and so now uh, I'm going to give you a sense of sort of who I am. So my background, is, as I said, is in, you know, is in bioinformatics, computational biology, and in animal science. So I, I'm sure some of you at least have heard of the book, The Accidental Taxonomist by Heather Hedden. Uh, when I first came to the library, um, I, I really had no idea what I was getting into. Um, but I was handed that book by one of my staff. Um, I said, you really got to read this. <laughs> and then apparently this author has been doing this now for 30 years. Uh, so I don't think she's... An, and, and the point was, she felt knew and didn't know anything about semantics really, but she'd been an indexer before. And I'm like, oh man, come on, you, you have an idea. That was, I'm coming, I felt like out of left field. Um, I met a person named Tom Baker who's helped me learn. He knew more about my, my the role that we'd done because he'd worked there be, with our, the library before um, with my predecessor who had been gone for two years. So there was, a, there was quite a gap there and that was really what the issue was. But this is just sort of deer in the headlights this is, you know, Jennifer coming to the library. Um, but really, what they hired me for, I consider as, as a machinist, is my experience with AI, my experience with software development and coding. And they wanted me to improve the automated indexing at the library. Um, they wanted me to increase the production. Uh, and, and that was part of my responsibility. I had those two responsibilities. And even coming into it, I did not appreciate the importance of the vocabulary but it didn't take me long, you know, learning how to try to improve the indexing was like, you got to fix this. This is, this is where it starts. And so you all know that, <laughs> but I had to discover that, but that's what they brought me in into the library to do. So that's where the idea for not for the machine age came about because I realized that in order to improve indexing and then really it came later, about, uh, you know, we need to do data interoperability. That became more in my awareness. I'm sure it wasn't new. Um, all of this fit together, and this thing has just snowballed. It's just snowballed. And this year, it's on the list of top priorities for the National Ag Library. So I'm feeling, you know, I got, I got to keep, keep doing well. So people are getting excited about it. People want this to work, which is great, because that's different than the hesitation that we have to worry about in the real mechanics of getting the work done. So here's Tom Baker, consultant, developer, vocabulary and data shapes project coordination with me on this project. Um, and it started out with, with uh, just him and uh, another guy named Osmo Swaminen who helped us get started. Um, and, and so this is where we were focusing on the thesaurus itself. When I got there, it was, in a, it was stored in a relational format. It was in multi-test. You know, I quickly learned, you know, they kept, they would export it into SCOS, but it would always have some mistakes in it, you know, and I didn't even know that, you know, it was, the file was, I mean, it's just, it was just incredible. So we have moved it now to native SCOS and everything we do, we work in Bockbench and we work in Python and it's all in native SCOS. So multi-test is in the rear view mirror. Um, it was good for what it did, but, but you know, it, today SCOS is where it's at. Um, so we did that. Right now it has over 77,000 preferred labels all about agriculture. Um, and it is, I'm posing to the department a standard vocabulary for USDA to provide us with those machine readable persistent URIs that we will maintain in perpetuity 
at NAL. The other thing that is really important, I think, to, to help with this hesitancy of our users, and especially the ones that are most hesitant, is to give them flexibility to, as much as I can, allow them to do what they feel they need to do. Um, and so refactoring it as a concept space is one of the things to address that issue that we've done. And this is modeled after the Global, Global Agricultural Concept Space, or GACS, which was uh, a partnership with NALT and the FAO's AgriVoc and CAB Thesaurus. So the three, three arguably major agricultural thesauri uh, around. Uh, it's, 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 in a way, it's a Venn diagram, and I'm not going to get into the details of that, but that was the most important agricultural concepts in the world. They verified that by looking at how much of it was used in their corpus, the three of them, and it was over 25 million uh, articles to look at to, to verify that. Uh, right now, NALT, as a concept space, we can have vocabularies and vocabularies, and that's how I explain it to the non-semantic folks. But you have sub-schemes. So right now, we have four and growing. We have uh, full, which is NALT as it was, everything. Core, which is inspired by GACs. It's about 14,000, 15,000 terms. AWIC, which is animal welfare, has about a little over 800. And the NALT taxon, which has over 50,000 uh, organisms that are important to agriculture. And these can now be viewed and worked on separately or together, whatever they need. Um, and it's all part of that one standard system. So that makes it easier for them. It makes it easier for our uh, chief information officer to, to make a mandate, use this system. Um, we can add domain-specific sub-schemes with unique top concepts. And that's really, I think, really helpful. So the AWIC does not, it's, it's sort of in the bubble somewhere. It's not hanging off the top concepts with null. So they can put it where it needs to be. Uh, we also have right now, over 50,000, uh, about 50,000 closer exact matches, and that's already been mentioned today as a way to sort of bring in together other standards. So if, if, uh, if we mandate that uh, our users have to use this system, but they say, oh my gosh, all my stuff is in you know, some other wonderful vocabulary, well, if it meets criteria, and I'm sure it would if they're using it, we map to it, and now we can, we can bring that in. If there's any terms that aren't in NALT, and it's important to them for agriculture, it should be in NALT. That's kind of, they're the expert and I should have it in there. Um, and then getting to the survey, where it kind of led us on the NALT side to the survey is the, the, the partnerships for data innovation was also trying to gather semantic information from resources, researchers separately from us. And we're both kind of working in parallel. Um, and we saw that there was a connection here. Uh, that we, we could infuse NALT into their survey and bring NALT more to the beginning of the process of collecting this data using SCOS collections, which actually, and, and Tom can tell you, because um, he was around at the very beginning of SCOS, that it was already there. So it's something that, that is available in SCOS as the standard, which gives us a way to make relationships of words that are orthogonal to the, to the hierarchy. Uh, and that then becomes a re reusable collection, a semantic collection that we can use for the next survey. So it's not looking at granular stuff, it's looking at sort of soil, weather. What are all the things that go with those things? So if a cotton researcher helps us develop a collection for soil, and then a soybean researcher may not have the same things, but they probably have a lot of the same, we can reuse that to create a survey with soil collection. And then once we get more and more of these, we'll, we'll have less and less that they will have to create or that we will have to create. So it, and, that, and then the other thing that, that uh, Tom is helping us put in is something called punning, which allows us to uh, include properties captured in NALT with URIs. Um, so it's expanding kind of the, the ability for us to capture what we need to do. And that sets the, sh the stage for us to make data shapes, which then that's where they can get detailed and start to look at particular questions. But they can use this scaffolding that we have in NALT to, to begin that process. So a little bit about partnerships for data innovation. This is our current um, REE undersecretary. When this photograph was taken, she was the administrator of the Ag Research Service. And this is just, uh, that was launched in uh, 2019. Uh, the vision is to connect research data from lab to field to end user and not for the machine age vision is to normalize and connect agricultural data. So very, very much in tune. 
Um, and I put this quote that she put here that I think is really explains where the USDA is on this right now. The challenges we face in agriculture are complex, and you can see that by the many different things that we're looking at. They're complicated, and they require comprehensive approaches. The worldwide population is expected to reach 9 billion by 2050, and all those people will need to eat. That gives only about 30 growing seasons to figure out how to feed 2 billion more people. And so putting these things together to help us get the insights that we need uh, to prevent uh, you know, disease and, and other problems are, is going to be really important. So some of the synergistic projects that we're uh, uh, collaborating with PDI on, uh, 1.49 million uh, to University of Texas at Arlington. This is an NSF grant that's part of a bigger project uh, for uh, open knowledge graphs. Um, and we're in theme one. So there's this digging into soil carbon with USDA, a knowledge graph, informing soil carbon modeling. And, and this is so that for, this, for soil carbon, if you know about the soil carbon credits, and we can do this to try to help mitigate uh, you know, global warming and things like that, um, right now, it's really hard to tell what they're worth. You know, they want to put a monetary value on them and pay you know, farmers for, for doing things that can serve. But there's no good way to really know. And so this is where we're going to take the soil data that we have with Natural Resources Conservation Service and other parts of the department uh, to, to bring all that data together. So it's really important. So they're collaborating with the Ag Research Service and with the National Library uh, with us to do that work. And then going back to my genomic roots, maybe some of you have heard of this. I would expect some of you probably haven't heard of this, the Thousand Genomes Project, which is going out and looking for all these genomes and seeing where are the common ge uh, genetic, uh, so there's some genomicists in here. So looking at where's, where's the common uh, genes that are in there. And you know, I did this survey. You talk about how the USDA is sort of scattered and how they've been doing this kind of work. And if you search Google USDA glossary in, in quotes, you get almost 2,000. So I decided that I needed to do this to try to, to come up with a way to try to bring this together. And actually, the PDI team had also discovered this problem when they were trying to bring these in to help their researchers so they didn't have to do all this work. And it's like, my god, which one are you using? Why is there so many? So we're going to get three students uh, from uh, iFellow program at the University of Maryland with their library and information sciences uh, department. And they're going to, I'm giving them the target of at least 1,000 to come up with the method, method and write a report and to consolidate and reconcile these. And hopefully, this will give us some uh, definitions. There was a decision made before I got here that, hey, you know, the machine is indexing now. We don't need definitions. I'm like, oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> That's not a controlled vocabulary. Anyway, so, so we're going to try to fill in some of those gaps because these definitions exist. And all of these are official USDA vocabularies for whatever program. And, and what I found with the few, you know, we've, we've looked at some of them very closely. Many of them, most of the terms are really already in null. Uh, and then here is uh, the one with US, USDA and Oviedo University Foundation, Arnaca. Uh, Jose Emilio Labugallo is going to be here on Thursday, and he is the leader of the WESO lab there at the university. And this is where we're going to bring this kind of foundational work with NALT and the survey and collecting the data to, to transform that into creating data shapes, standard USDA data shapes that have that granularity and the detail that, that the researchers are going to need. We've got a five-year agreement starting in July 2022. We've initially gone through and familiarized the teams with everybody, PDI, ESRI, the library, um, et cetera. And the NACA team has worked directly with a cotton research lab, which I'll talk about a little bit in a minute, and the PDI team simultaneously, as I said, they've been working with numerous groups. They have a large team of PDI coordinators that work with different domain groups to collect this kind of information. So the PDI does has been working with this survey, and this is a tool by the company, ESRI, that I've mentioned, Survey123. And they've been collecting this kind of data, what's basically what's important to your research. It is organized by topic. So what are all your weather things? What are all your soil things? What are you know? And it, when I saw the, the uh, boxology diagram that the guys came up with, I went, I'm looking at the survey. So we started to see a possible synergy here. So we're going to infuse the survey with NALT URIs. 
initially and design and inject the semantics even before the, the researchers look at it and then have them fill that in. Those are loosely based on the experimental design in big blocks, again, not granular, um, but it's, it's a pretty good start. Um, it's really fast and easy to collect this data. Uh, it's more agreeable to them so far. Uh, but what stopped the PDI team was that when they got that data collected, then they came back to me. Okay, now I need you to help me semanticize it. How do I get it into null? This one, this one isn't in there. What's its broader term? You know, they they want nothing to do with it. They want nothing to do with it. So this is you know training the the researchers on that part again is so, so many of you have said, you know it can be a problem. So it was a significant er hurdle for them. Now the semantic team, the NACA team, knows how to gather this information. So we're working with this Cotton Lab. Uh, who actually helped fund some of this work, which is why they were selected. Um, so this required many, many meetings with the NACA team and with the, the researchers to, to basically work and, and semanticize and collect the data simultaneously um, at the same time and to teach the semantic principles to the researchers and say, okay, now that you know this, where should this go? How do we, how do we put this? Um, and just to work with them, basically to empower them to make these decisions for themselves, which I think is, is a common way to do this. Um, but it, it, so it facilitates probably the most accurate representation of the data. It's very, very high quality. Um, but the problem is for the USDA and, and for me, because I'm on a timeline, is it takes a really long time. And at the end, we only had one lab. So it just, it, it wasn't a bad thing, but it just wasn't going to meet that, re that requirement that the government was, was putting down. Uh, so, but we did get this draft boxology, and, and it is a little small, but you get the idea. There's some names of the box, like cotton sample and a bunch of important, uh, you know, terms to cotton researchers. And this is where it dawned on me that I'm looking at a version of that survey. So we start to bring it together. So we're going to take this and, and try to reverse engineer that into the survey because in the, you know in the next one we won't have the finished product so we reverse engineer this we reconcile those terms that are on that diagram with null we give them all a uri if they don't already have one uh, we, we decide which ones need to be properties we're doing all this work for the research community because they don't really want to do it and and it's not so deep i think that it's beyond the ability of somebody who has some training in biology and some background that can't do it uh, and so we get to, to build the vocabulary in that way. Uh, we get to decide which ones need to be punned. And we also start to model the data by just looking at which box are they in. We can start to identify a collection as being in the box, OK? Uh, and so that's where that goes. Over on the right is just the list of the overall steps that I have. And that's taken from an overview document a summary that, that I wrote about what we're doing. And so we have the semantic modeling the null reconciliation from there, and then we can draft the data shapes the, or the collections. Uh, and then this is reviewed. It's, an, it's going to be an agile process. So we can create visualizations. They can see the vocabulary. They can see the diagram, and they can go, that looks right or not. And they can help. You know, They don't really have to even know what's semantic behind it. We may have to ask a few questions along the way, but most of it will be done by that. Once it's finalized, then we can publish. Uh, and then we have standards. And so here, um, Tom actually just did this last night. It gives you a little example of uh, putting the collections together uh, there. So you can see he's got sample, and these can be nested. So he's got crop sample, and then nested under that is cotton sample. So it gets very specific to this particular research group. And so just with that, I just want to remind, and I, I've kind of tried to say it all along, that we're not trying to like be a precise ontology. We're not trying to do everything. We're just trying to get our hooks in, to get our hooks in there so that we can connect things. And, we can, and it's going to be better than if we kept trying to fight with those guys running out the door, OK? And we can really help them do what they really do want to do. They do want to do this. There's no doubt in my mind. The department is excited about it. I'm getting so much support, it makes me nervous that I have to like deliver things, you know, it, but, but that's a good problem to have. Um, so, so it's just enough semantics, and, and we've worked with that philosophy the whole way. You know, don't, don't overdo it. 
you know, we don't want to underdo it either, but, but just try to find that sweet spot. What, what can we do in malt that's reasonable? Sticking to the SCOS standard as much as possible without doing anything too weird, but, but maximizing it. And the thing that's really different in my mind is asking the semantic experts in the equation to, do a li to, to not rely on the domain expert so much, to do more of the work for them. And I think to me, that's what the difference is uh, for me. Uh, so what does that get us? This is kind of a list of what I think we'll get if we can do this successfully. Of course, we get a standardized semantic collection, data collection system. Uh, we get fuller support for the reluctant data generators. Uh, we have increased da in data modeling and decreased curation costs. In my mind, this hard work in NALT really only needs to be done once. There may be changes, updates, things like that. But once you get this general model for weather and soil, it's not going to change that often. Um, so if we can get, get this done once, it's going to be a huge foundation that we can use for AI and combining knowledge, knowledge uh, graphs and things like that with, with artificial intelligence. And so if we can do this work in our generation, I see this as our time to have that human input to get it right, to give the machines a better book to learn from and to read from. Uh, it, it gives flexibility, you know, not necessarily even new, but we're really making sure they understand the concept space. If they really want their own vocabulary, they can have it. If they have another one, they can map to it. It's not a perfect thing, but it's pretty good. If they don't like the pref label, they'll get an alt label. You know, the machine doesn't care. Um, it, fa it fast tracks the semanticization without handing the job over to a data miner that may know nothing about the domain, which is, is often how it works. I know it can be different, but... Um, and it, it provides us with reusable semantics, not just reusable data, but reusable semantics that we can build these tools to collect more data by reusing our own uh, semantic collections and, and data shapes. And again, I already said the foundation for AI for increased accuracy. I'm sure some of you have read some of the work about that. Um, and it provides a foundation for the department to provide linked data to get new insights for analysis and cross-cutting data important for data-driven decisions by farmers, uh, co consumers, educators, researchers, administrators, and governments. And it, very importantly, it meets these requirements and these new laws uh, for us to, to be transparent, to have our data interoperable, and it helps us to provide fair and care uh, data. So, and I, as I said, I'm an accidental taxonomist, so thank you to, to Andra, and these, these are the people, Armando Salato in, in, in Italy, uh, Eric Prudimo, who's here, um, Josh Moore, who's here, Kat Thornton, I think will be here Thursday, and Asma Swaminen are the, the ones who had not already been mentioned. Uh, in addition to Labra and Tom, um, that have just been invaluable in making this all kind of get to where we are. It is a work in progress for sure, um, but you know, I, I, the the department is really excited about it, and uh, I am too. So hopefully, we'll keep moving in in the right direction and help these researchers do what they want to do and what they really have to do for USDA. So, and that's all I have. Thank you very very much for your attention. Yeah, so I, I was uh, wondering, uh, a great uh, talk, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> um, so how are the data shapes used? Uh, is that just uh, for internal quality control? For, for, cost control? for right now, the, we are just beginning the data shapes journey. And I would okay. say that, you know, we spent the first couple of years really working the thesaurus over, or, or Tom, Tom did. With, you know, we consulted together. A lot of decisions were made, and a lot of changes were made, and we're really just now getting publishing it back and making it available for download and things like that on, online. Um, we're working now just adding collections. Uh, right now, the, the one that's available doesn't, ha doesn't have any in. I mean, this is this, we are really just kind of at the cusp of after, say, three years of trying to work with these researchers and especially the PDI group. They've probably worked with 10 or more different groups. And so they have a lot of perspective on what actually works for them. The survey works great, but the problem was when you got the data, you still had to do the semanticization. So if we can, if we can 
you know, do what, what the, the group was doing when they were talking them and doing it simultaneously. It's, it's sort of an artificial way to do that, but we will have to have a review in that. You know, they're, they're going to have to come back and tell us, does this boxology look right? They don't have to tell us how to make it and make all the little decisions. They can just make little corrections, hopefully not too many. So, so you know, we're just beginning. And then once we have this done, that's when then we'll be able to start making the data shapes. When, you know, everything's going to have a URI, everything's, you know, and we can start to really connect things. Um, but that's the plan. And, and I was talking to Tom earlier and remembering a quote by Denny, and I'm not going to get it right. The, the Wikipedia founder um, had said when, when they were at their 10-year anniversary, you know, and he was just amazed at how, how things had evolved and how different it was than he would have ever imagined. And we've only been at this, you know, half the time. But he said, you know, we expect to be surprised. We, we look forward to being surprised because then that's how we, things move in a way that maybe we couldn't have imagined and it's even better than we could have imagined. So that's kind of the attitude that I'm having with this is, it, you know, not everything has gone as planned, but that, that doesn't, that's not a bad thing. So we're, we're kind of working, it, working through it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the great talk. Um, Thank you. I wanted to ask you about um, uh, what is the potential, or I suppose that I saw a lot of... Um, harmonization already going on with Europe uh, via people involved, but um, it, are there, I mean, other than, say, Agrivoc and uh, the use of SCOS, are there uh, areas where you have uh, it, uh, influence or collaboration with, with European vocabulary builders? Um, I, I not really formally right now, nothing. I mean, we're, I think it's the same thing. We're such at an early phase and we really, there really was a lot of work to be done with the thesaurus itself and to get it into a concept space and to get, you know, Tom has just worked so hard to get the code that's going to help us maintain it. Uh, you know, and getting Valkbench configured, it's, it's a little bit different, you know, how, and I'm not getting into any of the technical details of that um, today, but, you know, I think that's something that we definitely want to do. You know, I think, um, as we work with groups, we find, especially there's one group in particular, is, uh, the pollinators. I mean, they they work with taxonomy of flowers and bees and bugs and, you know, all, just trees and all kinds of really different things. They have huge vocabularies that they work with on their own, that they're working with others. And, you know, honestly, they can't agree which one is the best one and new people into it are, are eternally confused. So having uh, USDA say, let's put it here, um, but the idea is that that if if there is an expert group like that that says vocabulary over here is the right one, then we map to it so that they can still use that, even though the USDA may say you must have an alt URI. Um, they aren't saying that yet, but I think that's where it's probably going. Um, we need to get you know, and I think that you know that that's not necessarily great news for them, but. If you're going to have to do it a certain way, isn't it nice you can still have access to, to all your, and everything is still linked. And then the more mappings we put to NALT, you know, I'm not building those tools to link them, but we're creating that foundation. So by mappings, you mean SCOS, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. SCOS, exact close match, right? Just using W, yeah. it's, a, it's a wonderful model. It does a lot. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot. So I have a question regarding the curation of the, the or the quality of the, the vocabularies you are, or thesaurus you're building. Mm -hmm. So so I guess that there are a lot of ambiguities and um, maybe if you semantify, you have spelling mistakes and things like that. Mm -hmm. So is there like a, 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 a good concept or a good way to 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 curate this data to to make it really uh, this these vocabularies to make them consistent? So, so how do you manage these huge vocabularies yeah, it, in, in it, this, with this recipe? Well, and for the thesaur, for, for NALT, I mean, it was first published in 1967. And, and you can actually kind of, you know, you can't see it, you can't hold it, but you can sense like, here's a group of things that were added in the 80s that, you know, they were doing it this way. And here's a group of things that were in the 90s and are doing it, you know, it's a different group of people. And you can kind of feel those things through through the data, and that's totally anecdotal. But I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. You know, people change and 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 what they're doing. And they're not going to go back and change that. But like for misspellings, for common, you know, things like we we have the hidden labels in SCOS that we use. Uh -huh. And so you know, if hyphen, not hyphen, yeah, you know, yeah. we, but we, it could be just simple. Yeah, 
deletions of of, of just just letters or something. Yeah, so, so, I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and that kind of thing is always going to be a part of search. I mean, there's ways to to kind of search so you can just mm. take the first part of the word or or whatever. But but the hidden label things, you know, they they provide a lot of just just not anything fancy, but you know, mm. they're all in there so people mm. can find things. As a machinist, I had to be deferential to that we do not that we have hidden labels. I'm like, why would you why would you hide hide them? The machine needs to see all of it, you know. Give it to all, uh, you know, that's kind of my thing. And I sort of hold that back, but, but that is not done. You know, we do not show the hidden labels on the website and it is not in that file, but we have it for our automated indexer and, and, and we have it for the search in, in the web uh, so that this thing can find them. But it's, you know? con I mean, you, you have like, co I mean, it's con uh, context sensitive, your data. So you need the con uh, context, so how, how do you manage that? The, it, the, the thesaurus context? does have, not in every concept, but if, if, this, if this is what you're getting at, is, is it does have like scope notes to say, you know, use this or use for, so that it has those traditional kind of thesaurus, because it was always made for indexing, our, our pub ag, I didn't even mention it. We, yeah, pub ag is what we do index with it, and we, you know, about when we're at full capacity, we're doing about 500,000 new articles in pub ag a year indexed with the thesaurus, with our thesaurus. And so it's, everything's been built on that, and a lot of the, what's in there has been driven by the, the content that the library has been ingesting into the collection. Um, so, you know, I, I work with all the issues of quality there, and it's really important to me that the collection is right. It's about agriculture because you know you tend to add things to the thesaurus if you're putting content that you know if the, if that isn't working right. Uh, so I am uh, that's about my business too. But but there are scope notes in there, and you know my feeling is that those can be really important. There I don't know that anybody's using them right now. I mean other than humans when they read the scope note because our our indexers we have a quality control system where they do actually index by humans as well as the machine. Uh, for quality control purposes, and they will look at null, and if there's a scope note, they will refer to it. Back in the early days, they probably, every concept had a you know, scope note, probably, unless it was glaringly obvious how to use it. Um, and I think that those are still important. I think that large language models could definitely benefit from those. And so I think, you know, that should be part of the machine going forward with Scott, for yeah. sure. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I have a final question that maybe we can discuss. We can discuss afterwards and yeah. over dinner. Sure. It's going back to your slides. You said you came from biogenomics, bio, bioinformatics, bioinformatics and and computational gone. biology. Everybody so says, ah, it's a sentence. What kind of degree is that? <laughs> oh, mine. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> but uh, you, then you went into the, uh, would you say, if you look back where you are now, did you do cost mappings between that, between the two vocabularies of those domains, or did you extend it? Oh, I didn't. I didn't do anything about vocabularies before. No, I no, came. no. I mean, conceptually speaking, so did, do you, is it just a moving from where you came to where you're now? Is it just a matter of learning the language? Oh, or? I think I think so. Yeah, I think largely it is. Um, I think I think the library um, world thinks differently than I do. Um, and, and I do struggle with that at times. There's a little culture uh, shock there. Uh, for me, when I first came, I mean, I've been there now almost six years, so it's, it's much, much less. Um, but, um, you know, it was, it was interesting. I mean, I kind of uh, asked my mentors, I wanted, to, I wanted to do what my degree was in. That was what I was shooting for. And um, I had the opportunity, this came open, and it was really interesting. Like, I always used, was interested in this sort of thing. I never could sink my teeth into it for, you know, because it just seemed so hard. And then everybody had a different opinion. And then I would kind of walk away going, I don't know what they're talking about anymore, you know. Uh, but I wish I had stayed. It would have been help helpful. But be having the genomics background, I think, was really helpful, really helpful for me um, to, to really catch on to things um, because there's a lot there that it is a different language. But I think the tasks at hand are very similar. Yeah, that was a big help. Okay, thank you. And I would like to end to oh my goodness. offer you a game. It's a game on <laughs> dealing with immunity and viruses. Oh, wow. So, Why didn't you give me this before COVID? I mean, it's, it's been so well, it's inspiration to now make the food equivalent of this game. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Thank you all. No, I really am honored to be here and, and really have enjoyed um, talking to you. And well, we, can, we continue. Great thank questions. You very much. And, yeah, I'll be here until Friday morning. So thank you.